Okay, welcome back uh, after break. Uh, is uh, Gertrude here in class? She's there. Gertrude, are you there? Or come back after break? Not yet, sister. Okay, maybe when she comes back, I'll. Uh... My audio is not clear. Can you all hear me? Lucy? Just a little bit of disturbance. Oh. Now is it okay? Yes, sister. Okay. Now is it clear enough? No. No? No, not so much. Then. Oh, he's saying it's not the mic. Audio is coming from the laptop. Oh. Camera also is warm, gone. Oh. No camera is there. Oh, Anytime you put off the camera or the audio, it changes. This is okay. This is all done. Yeah, now is it clear? Yes, it's clear. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, Angeline. Yeah, so Gertrude is back. So uh, Gertrude, I just wanted to, sorry, it's not John chapter 17, it's John chapter 5, when, jo uh, when Jesus heals that lame man by the pool of Bethesda, and, you know, the crowd is very angry with him. They question him, you know, and what authority he's doing, all these things. And one of the things that Jesus says is in John chapter 5, verse 23, he says that all, all, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son, does not own the father who sent him, John chapter 5, verse 23. So uh, basically Jesus is saying, uh, or he's explaining his relationship with God the Father. In the preceding verses, he's also saying, he's talking about, I only do what I see and what my father tells me to do. So they are angry also because he's calling uh, God as his father, that he's come from the father. And yet... Uh, the Jews knew, the Pharisees and Sadducees were questioning Jesus. They also knew that, you know, glory and worship only And so when Jesus is saying this, they are all the more angry because, you know, Jesus is basically saying here in his in the statement that uh, his uh, what is his relationship with God the Father, that he's, he's actually ascribing his divine authority, that he is equal with the Father, he's equal with God the Father, and he's emphasizing that honoring him or honoring the Father is equivalent to honoring uh, him as well. When you honor the Father, you are honoring God, uh, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. And it's also, you know, uh, here uh, 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 he's, Jesus is enforcing his identity as the Son of God and what is his role in this redemptive work. So whenever we ascribe glory to God, we are actually ascribing glory to the Father, Son, and the um, Holy Spirit. Because among them, they are one. There is no uh, you know, this perfect unity and oneness among them, okay? So if you want to prove about the deity of Jesus Christ, uh, John chapter 5 is, where, is a good chapter after Jesus heals the, the, the man of the pool of Bethesda. You know, whatever he says uh, is a good, um, uh, you know, basis for us uh, to prove the deity of Jesus Christ. So did that help um, us to get through yeah, sister. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. We not specifically ascribe praise, specifically ascribe praises to each father, son, and the Holy Spirit. If you yeah, praise you can. God. Yes, you can. You can say, I worship you, for, uh, Jesus. I worship you, Holy Spirit. We worship you. We worship you, God. If you we, can. If we don't specify, specify that, He's not going to get angry with us. <laughs> He's not going to get angry and upset with us. Because when we say God, it is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In their hearts and minds, there is no division. It's only for us, for our understanding. It's yeah, only we who specify, get confused. Yeah, only only praising God is more than enough. It uh, yeah. is all the three. Okay. Yes. Praising God is praising all three. Thanking God is thanking all three. Because they're one. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll move on. John chapter um, 14, uh, sorry, 12 verses 42 and 43. Can somebody read that, please? John chapter 12 verses 42 to 43. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put on of put the synagogue, put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Yes. So, amen. So, how can we, thank you, how can we always have a pure heart in, uh, in regard to giving God all the glory in our life and ministry? We need to pray. What do we pray? Psalm 115 verse 1 says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory because of your mercy, because of your truth. Okay, so this is a prayer that we can pray often that will help and keep our hearts pure and right. And like the psalmist prayed, we can also check our hearts and say, God created me a clean heart and restore a right spirit within me. And also we can do is we can question ourselves, hey, why am I getting so upset and disappointed because no one appreciated me? No one said anything good about what I have done. That means you need to check yourself and say, hey, I'm looking for praise from men. You need to ask God, God. There's anything that I did not do right, teach me, help me so that I can be better the next time. Okay. So on our, um, we need to, whatever we do as kingdom builders, make sure or ensure, ensure that, you know, all the glory is given to God. Okay. So also another aspect of kingdom building is that our authority on earth is dependent on our submission to the king. Okay, we've already spoken about this. We'll just look at it a little more. James chapter 4, verse 7. Can somebody read it, please? Online student, anyone would like to read? James chapter 4, verse 7. Hello, sister. Yes, please. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen. So our authority on earth is effective only to the extent we are in submission to the king right so you can be excited hey god has given me authority i want to use that authority and when you're using that authority you're not seeing any demons flee no sicknesses healed you know no people are raised from the dead no wondering hey god has given me authority and power yes the authority and power is there but it's effective to the extent that we are in submission to the king or in extent to the intimacy with the king john chapter 15 jesus says you know if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done so that the Father can be glorified, right? So we are to submit to God and the, this verse that we read in James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, we are, how can the devil flee from us? First to submit to God. So here we are rebuking the Satan, we are uh, you know, binding him, we are telling him to come out and the person is, the devil is not leaving that person, the demon is not leaving that person. You are wondering what happening, what is happening here? Maybe you are thinking, oh this demon is a very, very strong demon, I need to fast and pray. No man, you've got the authority in you. Why is the demon not leaving? It's because the amount you submit to God, you can resist the devil right okay so as long as adam and eve you know they were empowered to obey god and not eat from the tree that god asked them not to eat from as long as they obeyed god they were able to exercise their dominion and power on the earth remember god told them subdue and have dominion on the earth okay so they were doing that as long as they were in submission and obedience to god the moment they ate the fruit what happened they gave over that authority. They lost the authority. They gave over the authority to Satan. They lost their dominion and authority on the earth. Yes. Um, when uh, disciples were praying for demons, uh, one boy was there. Mm -hmm. So um, they can't able to uh, take, that, take that out. Mm -hmm. So Jesus scolded them or oh, like little faith. And then after they asked, why we are not hmm. able to do that hmm. so jesus answered uh, if you have faith faith and hmm. uh, do fasting fasting and prayer yes so if we are not able to do that so we should do fasting or prayer 
The fasting and prayer all is before you cast out the demon. So you don't wait for the time and you're not able to cast and then you're saying, oh, I'm not able to cast, that means I have to fast and pray. No, you fast and pray, you are living in obedience and submission to God. You are then walking in faith and, sub, you know, living in faith. And then when you approach situations and circumstances in your life, the authority and power of God will automatically be demonstrated. Right. Yes, there are some situations in life where we need to fast and pray for a breakthrough to come. Uh, that is when, you know, the violin take it by force. You're taking it, you're pressing in, you're doing what it takes for you to receive what is yours. That time you do it. But all of these disciplines that we have is a thing that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Not only when we face a giant or a mountain or a situation like that, then we go and do all of these uh, disciplines or ritual, uh, you know, uh, uh, things that build us spiritually, but we keep on doing it on a day to day basis. Okay, good question. Thank you. So, our obedience and submission to God are keys to kingdom authority. Amen. What is the keys to your kingdom authority? Obedience and submission. So, spiritual authority is simple. What is spiritual authority? It is His dominion in me that determines His dominion through me it is his authority in me that uh, you know determines his authority through me it is his power in me that determines his power through me so to the extent god rules and reigns in your life the extent he can rule and reign through your life the extent he rules and reigns in your life is the extent he can rule and reign through your life that means the extent that you are giving him submission in all areas of your life and then you can see his rule and reign be extended in every area of your life. You can see the life of God in every area of your life. Okay. So when you are under authority, you can exert the authority that is sub that you are submitted to. Okay. So let us not glory in man. Another thing that we can uh, do, uh, you know, uh, as kingdom builders is not to glory in man. Uh, we have already uh, looked at that in quite in detail. Okay. Uh, uh, so just like you all to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 1 verses 11 and 13. And someone else can read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6. 1 Corinthians first 11 to 13. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of close household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Amen. So Paul is, you know, people are being divided. Some of them saying we are following Apollos, Cephas, some of them Cephas, some of them uh, uh, Paul, right? So Paul is saying, hey, you know, did you receive uh, salvation through Paul or Cephas or uh, Apollos? Were you baptized in any of their names? No. In whose name were you baptized? Whose name did you receive salvation? Who died for the forgiveness of your sins? Jesus Christ, then, you know, why are you being divided? We are all following our King, our Lord and Savior. And who is that? Jesus Christ. So that, is mean, that does not mean that we divide ourselves and say, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas. Okay, look at what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Now these things, brethren, I have figured figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. Yes, so he's saying, you know, don't think, you know, some of you are saying, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, you're following Apollos, I'm saying I'm a, a following Paul, you know, saying don't be puffed up one against the other. He's saying, yes, while we honor and respect those in Christian leadership, we must be careful not to be puffed up one on behalf uh, of or against them other okay that means not support one and uh, you know uh, uh, you know cause division and uh, friction and um, um, disunity in the kingdom of god when we do that we cease to be kingdom builders but we 
uh, become kingdom dividers instead. Okay, so when you elevate yourself and think that everything is happening because of who you are, what you're doing, your ministry, your strategies, your eloquence, your charisma of preaching and teaching, then you are glorifying in man. You're not building God's kingdom, you're building your own kingdom. Okay, so when we elevate ourselves thinking that we are more spiritual, more sensitive to God, more prayerful, more anointed than others, we are glorifying in man. And it's time that we check ourselves, ask God for forgiveness and realign our hearts and our minds and our will to him. Okay. Why? Because we are accountable to God who judges all things. Okay. Uh, can you please read 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 3 to 5, please? But with me, it is very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light and the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the art, that each one's praise will come from God. Amen. Amen. Can you please read uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 9 to 11 as well, Lucy, please? Yes, sister. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to Him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what He has done, whether good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. Amen. Thank you. So while it's important for us to be accountable to those who God has placed in our lives, it's even more important that we are accountable to God, whatever we are doing, you know, how, what we are doing, how we're spending our time, how we're doing the ministry, how we are living our lives. We know that we are accountable to God because God is going to judge all things. Okay. And accountability is what is simply, you know, being true to God, true to ourselves, true to our family, true to those we serve, and true to those who watch over our lives, right? So the question we need to ask is, are we true to God in the way we minister, the way we do things? All of you are studying in Bible college. Are you true to God in the way you're studying, the way you're using your time, the way you're using your resources, all of us who are working, all of us who are ministering? You know, are we true to God? Are we true to ourselves? our conscience in the way that we are living, what we are watching, in the secret, what we are thinking in our minds. Are we true to our family, our spouse, our children, the way that we are living our lives? Are we true to those who serve, you know, you know, we are serving in church or to those who are watching over our lives, whether it's our parents, whether it's our, you know, the head of the family, our spouse, or whether it's the pastors, it's the leaders, our bosses that we are accountable to, are we true to those we are serving and those who are watching over our lives. If you are not true, then we cannot be true kingdom builders. We need to ask God. We need to correct ourselves because God is the judge. Okay, He will not judge us uh, uh, on the multitude or the magnitude of what we have accomplished or done or the degrees that we have got. He will judge us according to our motives. Okay. Um, uh, that is what it says in Matthew chapter 7, verse uh, 21 to 23. It says, we will be judged not for the greatness of our exploits that we have done, but for our obedience to the Father's will. Okay, We will be judged not by the significance of our calling or gifting, but for the faithfulness with which we carried it out. I'm going to say those lines again. We will be judged not for the greatness of our the exploits that we have done, the things that we have done, but we were judged for the obedience. We can do great things for God, but some of those things are not what he has asked us to do. It's not his will in our life. So we will be judged for our obedience and whether we did the will of the Father. And we will be judged not by the significance of our calling, okay, or our gifting, whether you're called into the fivefold offices or not, or whether you're just a simple believer, a minister, you know, uh, but you will be judged by the faithfulness with which you have, with which we have 
carry things out, right? So whether I'm a teacher or a pastor or whoever I am, God is not going to look at my titles, my degrees. He is going to look at how faithful I have been to what he has entrusted and committed to me. God is going to look at each one of us and judge us on the faithfulness of what we have done and not our degrees and not whether we are called Apostle Selina or Prophet Selina or Pro teacher or Pastor Selina. It's not the degrees, the profession, the calling that is, you know, he's going to judge us, but with the faithfulness with which we carried it out. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, am I faithful in this season of my life? What, are the se what is the season that you are in? Some of you are students, some of you are working students, some of you are full-time homemakers, students, whatever you are. Are you faithful in what you are uh, doing, right? That is what we need to ask. Faithful in you've been teaching, learning God's word. Are you faithful in reading and studying and, you know, in living out what you are or you and I have been learning, Okay. So uh, look at what the angel of the church in Sardis writes in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Can somebody read that, please? And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says, He who has the seven spirit of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. Amen. Thank you. So here it's saying it's possible for us to have a reputation among men that we are very alive, that we are very powerful, that we're doing great ministry, people can applaud us. But if you're not doing what is God's will or in obedience to God, you know, in God's sight, we can be dead. Good as dead okay it's possible to be considered as anointed among people but you know god can be disappointed with us so our desire is that we work and and our ministry to be perfect before god amen okay so look at what it says on page number very beautiful it's page number 20 can somebody read that please page number 20 develop the heart of a kingdom builder the heart of a kingdom kingdom builder, a heart that is totally devoted to Christ the King, a heart that seeks to glorify Christ alone, a heart that does not deceive honor from man, a heart that does not glory in man, a heart that is pure in its motives. Amen. And what is the prayer that is there? Pray that God would create in you the heart of a kingdom builder. This is where all kingdom building begins. Lord, give me the heart of a kingdom builder. Amen. Amen. So uh, even as we're learning all these, uh, you know, uh, lessons, this course content, you can build such powerful prayers, right? We've been looking at even the kingdom of God, such powerful prayers. We learn from John, from uh, Isaiah chapter 9, you know, the names of the king, you know, how we can speak that over our lives, kingdom authority, kingdom thinking, kingdom culture, you know. So all of these can enhance our prayer life. And also you can pray and say, God, give me the heart of a kingdom builder. Right? Pray that every day and God will help you to be a kingdom builder. How many of you know this hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name? <laughs> it's a very famous Methodist hymn. It's not a generation. Any of you online students know this hymn? All hail the power of Jesus' name. Yes, no. Okay, I think it's my generation. So, <laughs> no, we sing it still in the Methodist hymn. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. Crown him. Crown him, crown him, and crown him, Lord of all. Very powerful hymn. I love to sing these hymns. It's just so powerful. It says, you know, crown him, Lord of 
all, right? Because he is king and all hail the power of Jesus' name, okay? We won't sing the rest of the <laughs> verses. We'll move on to chapter 3. Anyone has any questions in chapter 2? Sister, you have got very good voice, sister. Thank you, Sister Gertrude. <laughs> Thank you, Sister Gertrude. Heart of a kingdom builder is a heart that does not glory in man. Yes. No, please speak in the mic. Yeah, this uh, the ah. developing the heart of a kingdom believer. The fourth point: mm -hmm. the heart of a kingdom believer builder is a heart that does not glory in man. Mm -hmm. So, is it in reference to self or is it in reference to the man? A reference is suppose somebody is like preaching really well, and you say such an anointed preacher, such a blessed preacher, wonderful uh, man of God. Mm -hmm. So. In both the contexts, yes, it's talking about us that we don't, uh, you know, look for praise and applause from men. But also remember what we read about, you know, some say I follow Paul, Apollos and Cephas and, you know, all of those scripture references that we read. Uh, where Paul is saying, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, there he's saying that that can, we can applaud one person over the other and that's caused division in the uh, church. So don't do that, he's saying. Yeah. First uh, Corinthians chapter four was six, you know, where he says, uh, you know, be, we must be careful not to become puffed up one on behalf, uh, one on behalf of one against an other. Okay, when we do that, when we elevate elevate a man or an individual and give them, you know, go beyond their rightful place, then we begin to produce division and uh, strife in the church. Okay, so both things that we shouldn't do. Yeah, you have a question, Diksha? Yeah. yeah. So if God is disappointed with us, then this anointing still will work or? If God is disappointed with us, will the anointing still work? Good question. What do you all think? It will work? It's, uh, anointing is not revocable? How do we receive the anointing? Holy Spirit and also? comes from heaven, it is in submission and obedience to God. Okay, it's something that we receive, the anointing. Yes, it's given to us by the Holy Spirit. Uh, but the power of the anointing can also, you know, diminish when you're not, uh, you know, when you're not doing things that are honoring. But there are times when in a church context or when you're coming together as believers, you are the pastor and uh People are coming to, uh, so the answer can be yes. When God is disappointed with us, the anointing can uh, cease to flow. There can be no power in that anointing that is given. Okay, But in the church context, you can see that when people come with, you know, they come to church and they put extend their faith and they're looking for healing. They're looking for um uh, a breakthrough, they're waiting for God to answer, they're crying out to God, they're just pressing in. Can God minister to them or can that person who is the pastor, his life can be a hindrance from them receiving the answer? The, quest, the answer is no. The pastor's life will not be a hindrance. Even if the pastor is caught up in adultery or doing anything that is wrong or looking for power, position, fame, you know, whatever he's you know, gone away from God, but God can still minister to that person in that Bible study group or that church meeting where the person comes because that person is coming into the house of God, coming with faith, with trust, looking up to God, not to the pastor, looking up to God, crying out to God. So will the Holy Spirit minister to them? Yes. So when the Holy Spirit ministers and the person said, I went to the church, and, you know, or the person tells you, you know, today God ministered to me a breakthrough. I was healed. And you're thinking, how can she be healed? You know, the pastor is living such a, you know, his life is, we know, is not honoring in God's sight. Hey, this, his life is not honoring. But because of his life doesn't mean God is not going to minister to the rest of them. So, yes, is God going to be disappointed? Yes. Is the anointing going to diminish? Yes, it is. Because anointing depends upon the extent of our submission and our obedience to God. And that is the result of the power and the authority that flows in and through our lives. Okay. Good question. 
Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to um, chapter three, the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've already learned about, you've already gone through a course, the Holy Spirit. I've also taught you about the Holy Spirit when uh, in the first year, first semester, when we were doing receiving God's guidance, but we will just uh, look through it quickly. Okay, in kingdom building, it is essential that we also submit to the leading and the direction of the Holy uh, spirit okay uh, you know regardless of what we do whether we are in full-time ministry or not we must be led by the spirit of god okay so uh, those who do the father's will are rewarded in eternity those who do the father's will and not your own will you know those who are led by the spirit not led by your own feelings your own desires your own motives you will be rewarded in um, eternity okay look at what it says in matthew chapter 7 was 21 to 23 what jesus says in matthew 7 21 to 23 can somebody read that please not everyone who says to me lord lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father in heaven many will say to me in that day lord lord have we not prophesied in your name cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and i will declare to them i never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness amen so you know uh, too often we you know uh, you know initiate projects programs ministry and do a lot of things and just give that tag name you know just say we're doing it for god okay um, uh, you know sometimes god would have told us to do it is good we do all of these things but sometimes or often when god does not tell us and we do all of these things you know we try to give god's name uh, sh to show that hey this is the will of god but eventually it is our own initiative we've not inquired of god we've not asked him we've not waited upon him to lead us and guide us if this is what we should do but we just say okay god let me god wants me to do this or we just give the name of god and then we make it look as though it is the will of god okay so it's possible for us to do many wonderful things in in god's name but we can fail to do what is the will of the father right okay uh, it's also possible to do wonderful things in God's name, but not doing it out of a personal relationship with God. That means we can do a lot of things, but we, we are not asking God, God, is what you want me to do. You know, uh, show me what to do. What are the strategies? Okay. And not out of a personal relationship with him. Just because you want, you know, to grow your name, to go, your fame, to go. You think this is good. You can bring in this, can do this and that. It's also possible to do many wonderful things in his name and also be called as one who practices lawlessness. You know, this is what we are learning from what Jesus said in Matthew chapter uh, 7. Okay. So anything that is not the will of God, anything that is not born out of a personal intimate relationship with God, even if it's done in its name, it is lawlessness. So what is important for us as kingdom builders is, what is important for us as kingdom builders? Two well, things here. Yeah. Obedience and submission to God. Yes, our intimacy relationship with God and our submission and obedience to God. Okay. So our priority should be to know Him, to know His will, to practice righteousness, and then do uh, what He has called us to do in His power and in His name. Okay. So when we do that, the fruits that we bear will be lasting and good right we we saw some of the reformers yesterday and i told you like uh, you know william booth salvation army uh, amy carmichael you know uh, dona wood fellowship um, ida scudder you know um, setting up the velour uh, hospital and uh, medical school is still functioning even to day right and orphanages and so many things that men and women of god have started the bibles that they have printed is still there uh, today right so all of that work is lasting work it's the fruit that is born out of a tree that is 
good. So you need to look at your life and say, is my tree, is the life that I'm living a good tree or a bad tree? If your tree is, the tree is good, it will bear good fruit. Everyone will enjoy, it will be lasting. It will always be remembered, right, for that good fruit. Okay, so that is what we need to be, the tree that is good. Okay, and we know that even as we are going about uh, doing or uh, building God's kingdom, how do we know his will? How do we know God's plan and purposes? How do we know this is what God wants us to do? It's the Holy Spirit who reveals the Father's will to us on the earth, right? We already know that. Uh, we've read the scripture passage over and over again, John chapter 16, verses 13 to 15. Uh, what, how is the Holy Spirit uh, uh, referred to here in John chapter 16, verse 13? What is he called as? The spirit of? Huh? John chapter 16, verse 13. Spirit of truth. Yes, the spirit of truth. So mm. when the, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of truth, when he comes, what will he do? He will guide you into all truth. What else? He will not speak on his own authority. He will speak whatever Jesus is telling him. And whatever he does, he will take from Jesus and he will declare it to us. And whatever he does will glorify whom? Jesus. And all things that the Father, you know, uh, 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 Jesus says, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said he will take of mine and declare it to you. So here again we see Jesus glorifying the Father. The Holy Spirit glorifying whom? Jesus. Doesn't mean that because they're glorifying each other, their rank is different. They're all one. They are co-equal, but it, it just teaches us how each one of them are also working in unity, in submission, and in honor for each other. Okay. So the Holy Spirit speaks to us the very things that Jesus is speaking. Whatever the Father reveals to Jesus, that the Holy Spirit reveals to our hearts. So if you want to know anything regarding any area of your life, you can ask Holy Spirit, reveal to me what Jesus is saying, what the Father is revealing to Jesus. Another important thing that we can also learn from this verse is that the Holy Spirit reveals things ahead of time. Why does the Holy Spirit reveal things ahead of time? Why? To edify us? To build us up? To prepare us, right? We learned, right, in uh, Minister's Foundation, prepare us so that you can say, God, I'm in this season of my life. I'm in the second year. Soon I'm going to be in third year. You know, I'm going to step out. What am I going to do? Or I'm finishing my Bible college this year. God, what do you want me to do? All these things that I studied. How do you want me to use it? Invest it in your kingdom. Ask the Holy Spirit. He will tell you what is going to come in the future so that you can plan and uh, prepare. Okay? So... The Holy Spirit will always say things that glorifies Jesus, whatever exalts and magnifies his name. Okay, So if you want to know, hey, is this my own emotions? Is it my own voice, my own feelings, my own thinking or the Holy Spirit? How do you discern? How do you know? The Holy Spirit will always say things that glorify Jesus. Okay, Then you can know that you've heard from Jesus, because none of the things that he tells you to do will promote you or exalt you or him. It will also always be what he has heard from the Father and from Jesus. Okay, Romans chapter 8 verse 14 says, As many as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So as sons and daughters of God, we have the privilege. What is the privilege we have? We are led by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we can know the heart and the mind of God. We can know the Father's will because the Holy Spirit makes known to us the will, the heart and the mind of the Father. Isn't that amazing? Right? So you can know the heart and mind and the will of the Father. So you want to know the heart and the mind or the will of the Father in any area of your life, whether it's concerning your business, your job, your ministry, um, your family, your children. Say, God, Holy Spirit, you are the one who reveals the truth. Reveal to me what is your will concerning this area of my uh, life. What is the Father saying? What do you want me to do? Okay. So... 
it is important that we are led by the Holy Spirit so that we can do the will of the Father. Okay. The other thing that we need to understand or remember is what is born of the flesh uh, is of the flesh and what is born of the spirit is of the spirit. So we can give birth to things of the flesh. We can give birth to the things of the spirit. Look at what John chapter 3 verse 6 says. Can somebody read that please? John chapter 3 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born, amen, thank you. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Which means whatever is born of the flesh, we can, cannot convert it into something of the spirit, right? Very often, we give birth to things in our own strength, in our own energy, our own imagination, in our own flesh. And we hope somehow that it will become, the Holy Spirit will breathe God's life into it, you know, will bring about God's uh, plan and purpose through it. It cannot be done. Okay. Let me give you an example from Exodus chapter 30, verses 22 to 23. Here God is speaking to Moses and he's telling him to make an anointing oil. This anointing oil is supposed to be like, uh, you know, a, a, an oil that will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, sprinkled on the utensils, the lampstand, the altar of burnt offerings, the laver, the basin, uh, everything in the tabernacle, the lampstand, everything so that it can be holy and pure and anointed. So he's saying, hey, make a anointing oil. And he's giving them all the ingredients and also the amount of ingredients that you have to use. And then he's saying, you know, when you make this, none of you should use this as personal perfume. You know, some people can say, oh, it is so wonderful smell, so wonderful it is. We can, we know the composition. We can also make it as an anointing for our, you know, for our, like a skin lotion, body lotion, or like a perfume. So what is saying? None of you should even do that, okay? Because this is holy and it's holy unto the Lord. If anyone does this, he will be cut off from the people, cut off from God's own people, okay? So what do we understand from this? The holy anointing oil that God asked them to make in the Old Testament is a type and shadow of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, okay? So some of the lessons, important lessons that we can learn of this Old Testament type and shadow of the anointing of the Holy Spirit is whatever is used in the service of God must be anointed to God. That is what we look in verses 26 and 28. It says, with it you shall anoint the tabernacle of meeting and the ark of the testament and also says, you know, anoint the utensils and the lever and everything. Then whatever is anointed by God becomes consecrated unto God. And that's why God says, you know, this is uh, in verse 29, you shall consecrate them. You know, they will be most holy. Whatever touches them, you know, must be holy. All of these utensils, utensils lampstand, everything, when it's anointed with this, sprinkled with this oil, becomes holy. So whatever is anointed by God becomes consecrated unto God. So which means you and I are anointed by God. We are consecrated to God. God will not anoint anything what is born of the flesh. God will not anoint it. God will not tolerate any imitation of the anointing, okay, uh, which I already mentioned to you, which he says in verse 32. What is born of the flesh does not have the life and the presence of God, okay? So God cannot anoint what is born of the flesh. What is born of the flesh is just an imitation of the true work of God, and it will be cut off from the life and the presence and the anointing of God, okay? Uh, just to give you an example from uh, church history, uh, you know, uh, in church history we see, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you remember when we were studying, uh, you know, in uh, Christian history and missions in the early church history period, uh, you know, uh, 
um, we looked at some heresies, Arianism, uh, Montanism, right? Montanism. We didn't look at in detail about Montanism, but Montanism is a movement that was founded in the second century um, by, you know, a self-proclaimed prophet who along with two other prophetess women claim to be directly inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they believe that their movement represented a new outpouring of the Spirit that was greater than the apostles had received in the early church. Okay, So they practice this extreme sense of asceticism. You know, they claim to receive direct revelations from God. They uh, advocated strict moral standards and, you know, um, which was something that was beyond what is accepted by uh, the church. And Montanus, who started this whole movement, believed that the end times is near and that his group had a special role in preparing for Christ's return. Okay, But many of the church's leaders and many of the theologians at that time, you know, they recognized the dangers of Montanism, that it was something that was a movement that was based on human emotions, just uh, fleshly ambitions and zeal. And, you know, they um, because Montanism uh, placed heavy emphasis on their personal revelations and their ecstatic experiences, which were, they were saying is the work of the Holy Spirit. And by doing that, they deviated from the teachings of Scripture. OK, so the church rejected uh, the teachings and looked at them as a doctrinal uh, error. OK, so here we see that. You know, this was a something that was birthed out of the flesh. Something had, they, they said it was revelations from God. It was the movement of the Holy Spirit and all that. But we see that this movement did not bear fruit because it did not have the presence and the power of God. And it died it, uh, in itself. Okay, It died and uh, it did not have a lasting impact. Okay, So they're like this. There are many things that are birthed out of the flesh, which does not have a lasting impact, but will have some similarities in accordance with what the scripture says, or they say, Christ told us, this is what is there in scripture, this is the move of the Holy Spirit, but it's actually the work of the flesh, okay? Um, so we'll stop here, we just have two more minutes. Anyone has any questions? And we'll begin from um, this next. Uh, my picture's frozen. I don't know. Can you hear me? Any questions? There's some problem with the video. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, uh, we are back again. There was some problem, issue, uh, technical glitch. Okay, thank you everyone for attending class. Anyone has any questions before we finish? Or end class, any questions? Please read through this uh, publication. They are wonderful, um, just so enriching. And, uh, you know, lift that out so that you can be true kingdom builders. Okay. Thank you, everyone. God bless you. The other thing I just wanted to say before we close, sorry. Uh, can I post the assessment for the, uh, the lesson seven, right? Till lesson six you had for thing. Lesson seven till lesson 11. Can I post the assessment on uh, Friday, kingdom of God? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everyone. 
Uh, I'll post the assessment on uh, Friday for uh, uh, Kingdom of God, the, the rest of the lessons that are there. And uh, I'll give you the due date as well. Yeah. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. God bless.